Okay. Um, so yes, hi, I'm Rebecca Green, um, and today I'm presenting about learning to read and write Aboriginal languages through phonics in the Northern Territory on behalf of my colleagues, Margaret Carew and Courtney Lynch. So um, this paper started with a presentation at the Gavin Breen Symposium in 2020. Margaret Carew, Jane Simpson and I all came up with the idea of a presentation about Gavin Breen's work with speakers of Aboriginal languages in developing and promoting literacy in their languages. There are many aspects involved in learning to read and write. In educational circles, popular ways of representing the many skills required include Scarborough's Reading Rope, which you can see on the right, and Cons's Big Six. And in this paper, we're focusing on the strategies by which speakers of the languages learn the relationship between spoken sounds and written symbols, letters or graphemes. This is referred to as decoding in Scarborough's reading rope and as letter sound knowledge or phonics in Konza's big six. Approaches to teaching phonics can be described as incidental where sounds and graphemes are taught as they occur in texts, or systematic, where all sounds and graphemes are taught in a structured sequence. And systematic phonics can be divided into analytic and synthetic approaches, which we're going to explore in this paper. Print literacy in Aboriginal languages in the NT had several separate but interconnected beginnings including missionary linguists, academic linguists, including Ken Hale, the bilingual education program in Northern Territory schools, which started in 1973, and the establishment of the School of Australian Linguistics in 1974. One of the aims of the bilingual education program was to develop competency in reading and writing in the Aboriginal language. And to achieve that aim, the Department of Education was heavily dependent on assistance from mission and SIL linguists, who'd analysed and developed practical orthographies for four of the languages of the earliest bilingual programs. The department adopted the method of teaching literacy developed by Dr. Sarah Guczynski, who was then International Literacy Coordinator of the Summer Institute of Linguistics. The Kuczynski reading method was developed to teach adults to read and write in the other languages, like the Bible. It involved were picturable items, as they were described, which were presented in graded primers with a picture. The word below it, as you can see, below the were letters within boxes. And the words were also learned by sight, and the syllables once analysed could then be combined or synthesised in different ways to make other words. There were other steps in the process too. One example of successful adult literacy learning using the Guczynski method was Barada in Manningrida. David and Kathy Glasgow arrived in Manningrida in 1962 to start translating the Bible with Barada and Granatpa people. And you can see there the cover and first lesson of one of the Guczynski style primers published by Kathy Glasgow in 1974. But learned how to read and write. For example, Jimmy Nalakun and Katie Fry. Katie Fry worked for many years as an assistant teacher at Manningrida School and published many texts for school students. So in early 1973, Guczynski ran an eight week workshop in Darwin for the bilingual education program. 
to provide the necessary guidelines for the production of a series of graded readers in Aboriginal languages. That resulted in primers for four of the five bilingual education programs already operating and for three schools where bilingual programs were commencing in 1974. Um, where the primers were used in 1973, reported the Guczynski method is working well in this school, although the set lessons were considered too long for young children and needed to be divided into several lessons. Millingimbi School reported it's felt that some of the children this year are too young to cope with the analytic approach of the Guczynski method. And Shepherdson College on Elko Island found the same. And Murugul School went further and came to the conclusion that synthesis or sound blending must be taught first before the children attempt to analyze words. Uh, it's important to note that the bilingual education program was not only concerned with teaching phonics. Schools developed local curriculum and print literature that went with it, including by visiting country and recording knowledge. It's not hard to understand why Indigenous educators preferred to focus on teaching the cultural knowledge when the content of the texts was more motivating and meaningful than a focus on phonics. Schools also researched and adopted or developed other methods of teaching literacy based on language experience and breakthrough to literacy approaches. Um, and one was the walking talking text methodology developed by Fran Murray, which incorporated a walk, do talk record strategy. Phonics was taught, but incidentally, um, Walking Talking Text has been localised in several places and in the middle you see a Wadapi or Goanna planner used to plan the teaching of Walpuri. One of the feet represents phonics, but it doesn't provide a systematic framework for teaching phonics. The Kuczynski method was not the only one used at bilingual schools. When the Walpuri bilingual program began in 1974, American linguist Ken Hale, who'd studied Walpri from the late 1950s, was invited to come and help the school get started. He taught Walpri adults to read and write Walpri, and in the bilingual program in the school, Walpri literacy was made up of phonics based on Hale's syllable charts and the children's own experience stories. Hale had created graded literacy lists of syllables and words, which for adults started with four consonants and one vowel, and then introduced letters one by one. The consonants and vowels were blended into syllables, and the syllables blended to form meaningful words. This is a synthetic phonics approach, but whether Hale was aware of that or developed the approach intuitively, we don't know. As noted before, the bilingual education program was heavily reliant on the services of linguists and the supply of linguists became a pressing issue. A proposal to establish a school of Australian linguists was made by a, a linguistics was made by a number of linguists with the purpose of providing linguistic training for Aboriginal people. Gavin Breen began working at the School of Australian Linguistics in 1979, and he established an SAL branch in Alice Springs in 1981. By 1983, SAL staff were teaching hundreds of students across many languages, languages which the SAL staff did not know, whose spelling systems they had to learn or invent, and which very often had no dictionaries. Green collated and compiled existing word lists for many Central Australian languages and used fieldwork to add to them. From the word lists, he developed graded literacy lists similar to Hales for Walpuri. Jane Simpson worked with Breen on several courses in the Tennant Creek area in the mid 1980s, 
and she has commented on the meticulous care with which he developed the lists. You can see there um, the beginning of his central art and literacy course with instructions um, for the teacher and a lesson. So Gavin taught literacy courses in Aboriginal languages to many elders and cultural and community leaders in and around Alice Springs. He also worked with teacher trainees at Bachelor College through the Australian Languages Fortnight or ALF program throughout the 1980s and 90s. Cadage teacher and linguist Kumanjai Ross was one of Breen's students. She learned to read and write Cadage when she was a teacher trainee in her 20s and went on to make significant contributions to language documentation in her own right. Breen's word lists continued to be used for decades at SAL and the Centre for Australian Languages and Linguistics, or CALL, as it became. Breen also passed them on to other colleagues. When I started working as Barclay Regional Linguist in Tennant Creek in 1996, among the resources I found left by Robert Hugenrad were Gavin Breen's graded literacy lists in many languages of the Barclay and Central Australia. I used them teaching adult literacy and ALF workshops in several languages, including Mutbura, Wambaya, Walpuri and Aliawara. They were very useful and the approach was very successful. Margaret Carew also used Breen's graded literacy lists at call when teaching linguistics to adult students and more recently has used his Anmadera lists working with the staff at TIC. In 2001, I began supporting the bilingual education programs in Barada and Jepana at Manangrita School. Phonics was taught incidentally, and many students did not have a clear understanding of the relationship between sounds and letters, and relied on the strategy of looking at the first letter and guessing the word. I decided to create lists similar to Breen's, first for the new adult assistant teachers, and then adapted for students of different ages. It was a teacher linguist and realized that a synthetic phonics approach. More recently, I was involved with the phonological awareness and early literacy test being trialed at Yundamu School. While visiting Yundamu, I discussed with linguist Gretel MacDonald, the upper educators, including Barbara Napananga Martin and former teacher linguist Wendy Bader how Walpi literacy was being taught there. While Bada's early teacher's guides, which were developed in the 1970s around Hale's graded Walpi lists, included explicit explanation and activities demonstrating how sounds combine to form syllables and syllables combine to form words, they felt that this had fallen away and students were rote learning syllables. They could recite the syllable charts, but they couldn't use the syllables to read words and stories. So I suggest revising, revisiting the synthetic phonics approach. One possible arranged by year level, very providing words with a limited set of phonemes. My proposal was adapted for classroom use in the transition to year two class at Yundubu by a non-Indigenous teacher, Courtney Lynch, and long-term Yapa educator, Nancy Nungarai Collins. Despite inconsistent use at the start and the fact that they were constantly changing and updating and refining the approach, they saw growth over the terms. And excitingly, they noticed that over the summer holidays, the students who'd been in their class had near full retention of their sounds. Lynch then moved to Nirpi School, where she teaches in the senior class. She the input from experienced Yapa educators, including Fiona Napaldari Gibson, 
Barona Jara and Yuri Jaburula Wilson and adapted it to fit within a practical classroom approach for all years within the school. Instead of specifying a sequence of graphemes for each year level, there are color coded levels. Students learn letters and sounds in order through the color levels, red level first, then green, then purple, and so on. One innovation that has proved highly successful student, the literacy packs contain the graphemes and syllables, some sight words, and a phonics reader in sequence. There are phonics a set color level to find out what students know in order to differentiate their literacy pack to meet their needs. For example, if a student is getting most of the sounds wrong in red level, then they need to learn the red level sounds. If a student gets most of red level right and most of green wrong, then they learn the green level sounds and the teacher adds to their literacy pack the sounds they get wrong in red level. Using individual literacy packs addresses the challenges of remote teaching, which include low or sporadic attendance, students trickling session, a vast range of abilities in each class, and shame when students have to perform in front of others. So the morning session is dedicated to one-to-one -to -one reading in both English and Walbury students in their reading as they arrive without missing out on a whole class lesson. Their literacy pack remains the same if they're absent from school, so it's turn. And the one-to-one -one style means they don't have to perform learning in front of others. It's shame. Uh, now, here we have insight into how it happens. So after implementing the program in the senior class at Nirpi midway through term three last year, been so grateful level point they just is that students have moved up levels that they haven't received explicit instruction in. They believe this is because they're starting to apply the skills learned in those one-to-one -one sessions to more difficult spelling patterns. They've also found that students love it so much that they end up practicing multiple times a day whenever they finish other work. Um, as the upper teachers work one-to-one -one with each student every day, they do informal assessment. When they observe that students know all the sounds and syllables in their literacy pack, they move the students up to the next level. The students also have a visible record of their successes in learning as their names move up a color ladder on the wall. 
They also have ongoing stimulus as they're presented with the challenge in the next levels of more complex graphemes, syllable shapes, and longer words containing suffixes. Here's a comment from FM, one of the assistant teachers at Nirpi. And she says, it's good one-to-one -one teaching. Kids learn better that way. If it's two or three, they learn, but if they don't learn, it's really high through all the levels. I can do things like sound it out for neuro, and then cover the syllables and teach them to do syllables. We'll make Walpri every day and learn Walpri like they're learning English every day. Um, very near the end now, um, just to say um, the approach of color coded sequence um, for teaching graphemes has been adopted and adapted for Pitindjara after an officer of the South Australian Department for Education visited Yundamu school recently. It's being implemented in schools in the APY lands in South Australia and shared back to Arionga school in the NT. Uh, I think I'm probably about out of time there. Um, the last slide is just a summary of what we've talked about, which is by no means the full picture of phonics. Um, teaching in uh, NT schools in Aboriginal languages. Um, but I'll just finish um, by uh, saying that this synthetic phonics program based on Hales and Breen's approaches is now finding a place in schools and it provides an approach that Yapa educators can confidently maintain through changes of non-Indigenous staff. And Yapa school students are benefiting from an approach that allows them to build firm understandings of the spelling system and confidence in themselves as learners, readers, and writers. Thank you.